Right, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the Iowa Foundation on this rather rainy Friday evening. I'm glad you could make it. Um, this is described as a book launch of, of this book, Strong in the Rain, although um, I think the book in fact has been out for about a year. Um, but the, the good news is that we're going to get quite a lot of updates on the situation um, in the Tohoku area. And um, our speaker today, David McNeil, in fact has been there as recently as about a week ago, um, and has been talking again to the people he interviewed uh, for this book. So hopefully it will bring, a, it'll bring us uh, up to date on the situation there. Because of course there's been a bit of a tendency to forget about Tohoku as time has passed um, since March 2011. And I hope we, we won't let that happen. So David, um, he is uh, a journalist who's been in Japan for quite a long time. He was a little vague about how long because he's been and, and left and gone to China and come back. but he's, He's a very long established uh, journalist in Japan and he writes for The Independent, uh, The Irish Times and The Economist uh, and also for some uh, local publications including The Japan Times, the main English language uh, newspaper there. Um, and there's a, a list of other publications he's written for which is uh, probably too long to go through here. He's, he's also uh, been an academic and has uh, taught uh, full time uh, at Liverpool John Moore's University in his class. But um, more recently, of course, he's been focusing on what's been going on uh, in Tohoku particularly, and that's what you'd like to talk about tonight, so I'll hand over to David. Hi there. Um, do I need to speak into the microphone like this, or can no, you hear me? All right, all right. Well, thanks for coming along, um, and thanks to Daiwa and Chihoko san for, uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, my mum actually is sitting in the front, so she came over to uh, to, to listen to the talk. Uh, one of my favorite memories is my mum saying to me, uh, when all this disaster sta started, she said, um, uh, you're not going up near that power plant, are you? And I said, no, no, I don't go up there at all. And about uh, a couple of hours later, she heard me on the radio, uh, <laughs> on Irish radio, describing how I'd been inside the power plant, uh, uh, reporting on. So we all got a trip. We all got one uh, trip inside the power plant. Uh, I went last uh, January. So um, what I think I would do, first of all, I need to apologize for, the, the book is actually co-written. There's another journalist, um, Lucy Birmingham. Uh, my co-writer, uh, she can't make it. She rarely can make it, actually, because she's the president of the FCCJ, the Foreign Correspondents Club in Japan, uh, which is a real poison chalice, and she's very, very busy. Uh, so it's always me sort of carrying the can, you know, explaining the book. And the reason why that's kind of a little bit tricky is because the book is basically an account of the disaster. Uh, and what we, the way, when we thought about how we were going to tell the story of the disaster, uh, because we had both covered it as journalists, uh, and we've met all these sort of fascinating uh, people who told these uh, stories, these very compelling stories, uh, we thought, well, why don't we just tell the story through those people? Uh, so what we tried to do was to find um, uh, the six most compelling people, and the six figure, you know, the magic six figure, came to us via the publisher. The publisher had approached Lucy and said, would you like to write... Uh, a, a book about the disaster, uh, and they said, generally speaking, readers can only handle six people. Uh, we didn't know that. You know, we were going to put twelve initially. Uh, so we had to kind of pick six people who were going to be able uh, to tell the story uh, from uh, various perspectives, um, and that's really uh, what the book is about. We 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 focused on uh, the six most compelling people we could find, and I brought some slides along just so I can show you the sort of general background, uh, but also so I can show you the six people uh, who we uh, wrote about in the book. Um, and the other thing, of course, is um, I'm, I'm seeing some familiar faces, Philida, uh, for one, but I've actually given a talk about this book before in London. Uh, so rather than repeat myself, obviously I'll talk about the book and the background and stuff, but uh, I thought also what I would do is try and update you on what's going on. Um, uh, I was up in Fukushima for my 10th trip uh, last weekend, so I have a fair idea of uh, uh, the sort of situation up there. And I'll leave plenty of time for questions as well, because I'm sure people have a lot of those. Uh, so this photograph, the one that's on the screen at the moment, that's from Rikuzen Takata. Uh, Rikuzen Takata, of course, was uh, very badly damaged uh, in the earthquake. Um, 
the first trip we made up to Fukushima was on March the 12th. Um, most of the journalists who were in Japan at the time were uh, trying to get up and see what was happening. Uh, and Rikuzen Takata is the first major place that I saw uh, on uh, March the 12th. Okay, um, so what, what we tried to do was, um, when we were up there, we met all these people, as I say. Uh, this is uh, one of them. What's going to happen is we're all going to flick through here because it's on a slideshow. Uh, the person you just saw, the gentleman who... And we can just stop it now. Okay. Right, I can stop it like this, can I? Okay. It's, it's stopped. All right, all right. Do you have to go back? Uh, yeah, just to the previous one, sorry. Oops. Thanks. Thanks. Oh. Uh, stop it there. Stop. Okay. Would you be my wing person? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, this guy, um, so what I did was I picked three people, obviously. Lucy picked three. Uh, this was one of my, uh, one of the people I picked. Uh, this is the mayor of uh, Minami Soma. Minami Soma is the um, the biggest, well, it's the only city really. It's the city that's closest to the Daiichi power plant. It's about 20 <coughs> kilometers north of the power plant. We have some technological remnants after all you're setting up. Uh, and I found him a very compelling character because, um, first of all, he uh, he was the mayor of the city which suffered uh, a huge calamity. I mean, uh, 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 I'm sure people know already, but. Right. Yeah, that's him. Okay, right. so, so you, his can name just, is... you can just skip through there. All right. So that's Katsunobu Sakurai is his name. Uh, Minami Soma was a town originally of about 71,000 people. Uh, during the disaster, as some people probably know, the population went down to about 10,000 10, people. Uh, most of the population fled from the disaster, even though the city itself, most of the city wasn't in the radiation zone. Uh, we talk in, a little bit, in the book a little bit, and I'll, I'll read an extract uh, shortly about um, the sort of process by which they fled. Um, basically what happened was the government was on the TV every day saying that there's no uh, danger to, uh, to the people outside the 20 kilometer zone. And they were also saying things like um, radiation had been contained inside of the reactors, and uh, uh, that was the line that was maintained for some time. Uh, the citizens of Minami Soma uh, didn't believe what they heard on the TV, and the city essentially kind of went into meltdown. All of the uh, people who could flee uh, fled, uh, the people who could get petrol, the people who had money, uh, and uh, the city was left uh, to fend for itself. And one of the sort of more interesting things that happened was the, uh, the mass media, all of the big media companies that were uh, covering the disaster, uh, left the city as well. They all uh, peeled off on uh, March the 13th to the 14th uh, uh, during the disaster, and they didn't come back for 40 days. And they didn't tell anybody that they were there. <coughs> so Mayor Sakurai was kind of furious uh, about this because he felt that as the biggest city to the disaster, closest to the disaster, that the media had uh, a duty, if you like, to cover what was going on. Uh, so when the first people who went to actually meet him were generally foreign journalists or freelance journalists. Okay, we'll work. Um, this is Itate. Itate was initially uh, uh, outside of the exclusion zone, outside of the irradiated zone. It's about 45 kilometers uh, away from the power plant. Uh, and there was this drama for about a month I don't know if anybody recalls, but uh, the, um, uh, the people like Greenpeace were going in measuring radiation, and they were saying that this town should be evacuated as well. It's a village in the mountains. It's very beautiful. It's picturesque. Uh, they practice a sort of sustainable farming. It's about 7,000 people. Uh, and uh, eventually, all those people had to uh, leave as well. They were ordered to leave because the radiation was so high. And if you go up there, um, what they've done is, and we can talk about this maybe later on, about the decontamination process, because I've just written about that. Uh, they have, uh, they've tried to decontaminate this huge area, um, and it's impossible. You know, one of the things that I wrote about in the article was, uh, how can you decontaminate a place like Itate, which is forested, uh, uh, heavily mountainous area. The radiation kind of seeps into the forest and into the ground. 
the way that they're doing it is they're scraping away uh, five centimeters of earth from everywhere they can. They put it into these black bags and then they leave the bags in a dump. Uh, and the, the sort of controversy is that uh, where, where does this radioactive waste go? First of all, we have to talk about how radioactive it is and whether it, it, it really affects people. <coughs> Uh, but uh, uh, the, the issue for the people of Itatimur is, well, that waste is not going anywhere because nobody will take it. So it sort of sits around in these bags uh, and will, presumably, for a long time to come because nobody will, nobody will accept it around Japan. <coughs> so uh, this is Itate as well. This is um, a farmer called uh, Katsuzo Shoji, Shoji Katsuzo. Uh, this is his family. Um, I went to interview them. Uh, uh, about two weeks before they were due to evacuate, uh, and uh, Shoji san was uh, basically a small farmer. He had um, about 20 cattle. Uh, he had a small plot of land. He grew cabbages, vegetables, that kind of stuff. And all of that had to be destroyed. All of the uh, vegetables had to be dug up. Uh, all of the animals had to be had to be killed, and then he had to just leave his farm, which had been in his family for since the Meiji era. Uh, and uh, they now live in Date, about 40 kilometers away, uh, in temporary housing. And again, they don't know if they'll ever go back. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need a wingman. <laughs> or a wingman. Right. Just okay. Would you mind? Would you mind clicking through them if that's okay? Yeah? Thanks. Okay. All right. So this is um, the second of my people that I wrote about in the book. Uh, this is a fisherman, uh, Ichida san. Uh, he is, um, the, the thing you find about Tohoku people, and, and you hear this cliche all the time, they're very stoic, they don't like to talk that much, they really don't want to explain what happened, and, and the thing is the cliche is actually true in my experience, they don't want to talk, and certainly the fisherman, one of, you know, when I found him, it took me a long time to find him, and when I talked to him, you know, I said, what happened to you, and he told me his story, and it was, it was an amazing story, I mean, first of all, the fishermen up there all know that when there's an earthquake, there's going to be a tsunami. Uh, and what they do is, instead of running away from the tsunami, they all go into the tsunami, which, you know, if you think about it, is, is sort of counterintuitive. So he, uh, he first of all, uh, helped his parents, his elderly parents, and he raced down to the sea in Soma, and he drove his boat out into the sea, and if you can drive it fast enough, you can, get, uh, you can beat the tsunami before it hits the coast and really builds up power. Uh, and he sort of rode it, he describes, riding these waves like a roller coaster, feeling kind of sick, you know, uh, uh, because there was a, a number of them, of course, not just one. And then waiting in the sea, in the flat sea, for the tsunami to pass, and not knowing what had happened, and not being able to phone because his phone wasn't working, and sitting in the freezing cold out in the sea, because he didn't bring, his, didn't bring any proper clothes. And then going back in the morning when he thought it was safe, and just seeing Soma completely laid waste, you know, uh, uh, and... Uh, nothing left, including his own home. Uh, and then that was sort of only the start of it in a way, because then there, there was the, the radiation drama. Uh, the Soma plant is not that, sorry, Soma city is not that far away from, uh, from the Daiichi power plant. And uh, he describes the story about his daughter lives in Chiba, and he, was, uh, he refused to move. He, he stayed in Soma, and one by one, all of the people he knew around him kind of peeled off Silently, they didn't talk to each other about what was going on, but they became very concerned about the radiation, and uh, they just left uh, until there was a very small number of people. Uh, and his daughter was calling him up all the time, saying, "You have to leave," crying and begging with him, and so on. And he said, I "I'm not going to leave." And even now, he's not—he's really not able to explain why that was, other than that he—he uh, he felt that he needed to be where he was born, where he lived, and he couldn't take his elderly parents. He felt it was dangerous to take them. Uh, so when I, when I heard the story, I said, you have to tell us, and he said, I'll tell you the story once. Uh, you can tell it in your book, but I never want to talk about it again. Uh, and I made the mistake about six months later of telling a BBC film crew, they made a documentary called Meltdown, which is a very good documentary, actually. 
about him, and they phoned him up, and he immediately phoned me and said, why did you tell the crew about me? I told you I don't want to talk. And he was genuine about that. He just wanted to get it past them. And maybe that says something about either Tohoku culture or Japanese culture, I'm not sure. Just the desire to sort of get past something horrible, to not relive it, because, you know, I'm Irish, and when something happens to Irish people, they not only want to tell it, but they want to keep telling it. And every time they tell it, it gets better and better and better. And better. <laughs> he was the complete opposite. You know, he, he, he just didn't want to, to relive this drama. And of course, you had to have a fisherman in a story about the disaster because, you know, fishermen are so synonymous with Japan. And then the third person I wrote about is, is this gentleman here. Uh, we can't identify him uh, because he's a nuclear power plant worker and he spoke anonymously uh, for the book and, and spoke anonymously to, a lot of, to, to quite a few journalists. Uh, we call him Watanabe in the book. Um, and he's a, a fascinating guy as well because First of all, he was working in the power plant. Uh, second of all, he's from uh, Okuma, which is about two miles away from the power plant. It's actually one of the Ustaba and Okuma are the two places that hosted the power plant. Um, and he uh, had spent uh, most of his adult life uh, working in the plant. Uh, he was 18 when he started working there. And his grandfather, who was also a power plant worker, said, it's perfectly safe. You don't need to worry. I've been in the power plant for 20, 20 odd years. I'm perfectly healthy. His grandfather was in his 80s. And that's why he went in. You know, um, uh, and he was there on the day of the disaster. He fled like everybody else. He went to Iwaki down south. Uh, and the sort of amazing thing for us, I suppose, was that he wanted to go back. Uh, and he waited patiently for the call. He knew a call would come from his contractor. And then he did. He went back into the power plant. And he's, it's kind of, he's, he's an odd mix. He, he, um, uh, I, I suppose his political mindset would be quite nationalist. Uh, he, uh, he describes himself as going into battle waving a Hinomaru, but not uh, battling for his country, more battling for the local people, the people around him. Uh, he had that sense of, of, well, we helped cause this disaster. We want to now fix it. Uh, so he, uh, <coughs> I talked to him last week. He, um, he got uh, enough radiation during the time that he was back in the power plant trying to fix the problem, his, his job was to lay pipes to try and keep water going through this makeshift uh, system that they have to keep the nuclear, power, uh, nuclear fuel cool uh, and to clean up debris. And he got so much radiation that he had to quit for a little while. And then he went to uh, the Dai uh, Ni power plant, J Village, and then, uh, amazingly, uh, he was sacked. He was sacked uh, uh, about two months ago. Uh, so when I met him a couple of weekends ago, he said, I don't have a job. And I found that amazing. You know, I said, well, I heard there was a labor shortage up here. And he said, it's true, but TEPCO doesn't have any money. Which again, you know, maybe we can talk about this in question in the question time, but it's fascinating to me that a disaster on this scale, TEPCO can run out of money to pay people. And, and he wasn't paid a lot of money. He was paid about uh, 180,000 yen a month. So, uh, while we were talking, the, this whole Olympus, uh, Olympic thing was going on, and, and um, the government announced that it was going to give more money to try and keep, stop the leaks inside the power plant. So he was rehired, or he was about to be rehired, back into the power plant uh, to monitor the uh, tanks, these huge <coughs> water tanks that they have all around that have mushroomed in the power plant. So he's, he's back there now, uh, despite the fact that he's actually had too much radiation. Uh, he's being paid um, Ichiman Roxy in a day, which is $160 a day, to monitor these uh, tanks uh, uh, for on a very short-term contract, about three months. Uh, uh, again, to me, uh, um, a waste of a waste of human talent in some ways. And certainly, they're not paying him enough. Could I have the next photograph? Sorry. All right. Um, this was. Um, this was supposed to be my Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. Um, on around about the March the 29th, March 30th, when it was still not illegal to go inside the 20 kilometer zone, uh, but it was considered very dangerous. If you recall, March, on around about April, mid-April, I think it was, 2011, the government made it illegal to go inside the zone. But before then, you could go in, it's just nobody was going in, possibly because it was dangerous, but also, we talk about it in the book a little bit. The big uh, media companies in Japan 
who could afford radiation suits and Geiger counters, all that kind of stuff. They didn't go either. They just completely abandoned the story uh, to, um, to foreign journalists and to freelancers in Japan. Uh, and, and that's an interesting question why they did that. So uh, I um, went in. Uh, I was one of the bad number of five or six journalists who went in at different times. Uh, my mum's kind of probably going to be pissed off at this, but I went to the um, to the gates of the power plant, um, uh, and then took this photograph, which I think is is sort of very symbolic in a way, right? This is this, this is the visitor center of the Daiichi power plant, uh, and there's a crack right through the wall, right through the kanji actually for for nuclear power. Uh, and of course, one of the um, the big debates and the big controversies about the earthquake and the tsunami as well, was it the earthquake or the tsunami that did a lot of damage to the reactor one? And that debate for me hasn't really been settled. Uh, the uh, the diet report sort of hedged its bets and said it's possible or it's, we can't rule out the possibility that it was the earthquake that caused the damage, not the tsunami. And why is that important? Well, if it was the earthquake, then all of the reactors in Japan would have to be recalibrated and, and they would have to consider this, the impact of future earthquakes on uh, uh, commercial reactors if they restart them. Am I doing it right here? Is this one here? I think it's me. <laughs> okay, so this is, I won't talk too much about Lucy's three people because um, we don't have a lot of time. I can talk about them later. But this was Uabe san. She was a, um, a, a, a cook in uh, Rikuzen Takata, which of course was completely devastated by the, uh, by the earthquake and tsunami. Uh, and she lost her husband. And um, uh, she lost him. He was a government worker. He was drowned by the tsunami. Um, and she, in the three days before she found her husband's body, uh, she uh, was trying to, she actually saved the children in her kindergarten by running to, uh, running to a high place. Um, so she's a, like a lot of people in the book, it's full of sort of quiet heroism, if you like. I know that's a cliche, but they are. They're quiet. They're people who saved a lot of other people's lives, who really didn't want to talk about it afterwards. Uh, and even her, her grief, you know, she wasn't that happy to share her grief, but she did in the book. And if I have time, I'll read a clip from that. Uh, this is uh, the second of Lucy's characters. This is Toru Saito. He was a student, uh, and he uh, barely survived the disaster uh, with his family, and, and she talks about that in the book as well. And this is the third one. This uh, guy, despite appearances, is actually an American. Uh, he's uh, David. He's of Thai extraction. Um, and he, uh, just let me get the name of the village here. I think it was Matsushima, Higashi Matsushima. He uh, saved, he was, he was in a, a school gymnasium with these children uh, and uh, they thought they were safe in the gymnasium from the tsunami, but the tsunami completely uh, uh, drowned the, the, uh, the gymnasium and he saved the children. He saved a number of children who were in the gymnasium. And because he was an American, the American camera crews when they came over, uh, of course, latched onto him and featured him. He's in a 60, docu 60 Minutes documentary. Uh, and he's uh, another compelling person in a way. First of all, he's very religious. So he sees himself uh, in those kind of terms as somebody who has a mission, you know. And, and initially, he, like a lot of people, he, his mother uh, persuaded him to go home because she thought it was dangerous. But he came back very quickly, um, and he married a Japanese woman. He's just had a child, actually. Uh, and he stayed in Japan, and he's making his life in Japan. Okay, how much time do I have? Sorry, I'll be done for time. All right, so another no ten minutes for you. So, obviously, um, you know, and again, we can talk about this later. But the sort of nuclear story, in a way, took took over, didn't it? it took over from uh, from the tsunami and the earthquake story, and it's still it's still really, if you look at the newspapers, if I think about all that I've written in the last two and a half years, it's still overwhelmingly the nuclear story. Uh, you know, after straight after the disaster and for about a year afterwards, there was a string of very large demonstrations uh, culminating in uh, the 170,000 people, estimated 170,000 people in Yoyogi Park uh, last July. Uh, and then, for some reason, the protests stopped. Uh, people went home. 
Uh, I was at the, there's one outside the Kante, the Prime Minister's office, every Friday night. It's still going on, but it used to be thousands of people, and if, if the organizers are to be believed, to be believed, it was once 100,000 people outside of the Kante, which is an amazing number. I mean, you know, Japan really hasn't had those kind of protests since the 60s. Uh, but now there's a sort of a, about a, less than 100 people there now, uh, sort of anarchists, people wearing a lot of black uh, with stars on them, those kind of people. Um, uh, and uh, as, we, as we all know, the only pro-nuclear party in Japan, the LDP, uh, was elected back to power uh, in uh, last, late last year, uh, they didn't really make any secret. I mean, they kind of fudged it a little bit, but they really didn't make that much secret about the fact that they were going to try and switch on those nuclear reactors uh, again. And uh, so the big debate now at the moment is, well, are they going to be able to do it? Uh, how many are they going to be able to switch back on? We've just talked about this in The Economist. Uh, and uh, again, you know, it's, I mean, you don't want really for the nuclear story to take over because in some ways it's it's a lot less first of all nobody as we as we all know nobody that we know of has died of radiation uh, 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 and the people who suffered from the tsunami and the earthquake are much suffering much much more in many ways than than, uh, than the people who, who allegedly are suffering from radiation uh, but that's the way it's happened and this nuclear story I think is going to be the big story for a long time to come especially because of this sort of drama, this political drama playing out over the, uh, the nuclear power plants. Uh, this is um, uh, my hand holding a Geiger counter uh, in Itatemura, in the forest of Itatemura. Uh, if you, this was last week by the way, the Geiger counter shows 15.2 microsieverts an hour, which I'm sure somebody here will know better than me, but I think that's over 120 millisieverts a year, right? To give you an idea, uh, that's about six times the recommended annual dose for a nuclear power plant worker in most parts of the world. So uh, the, the sort of interesting thing about those about when you go back there now is the, the radiation readings, can you trust them? So if you look in the newspaper, it generally says Itate Mura is about one point something, you know, that, those kind of readings. If you go to the, there's a radiation counter, an official monitor in Itate village, right in front of the village office, and it said when we were there 0.65 uh, microsieverts, but when we held our Geiger counter to it, it gave twice that amount. A uh, little less than twice that amount. If you walk a couple of feet away, it's twice again. And then if you go into the forest, it's these kind of extraordinary numbers. Um, we asked around about why that was. Like, why are the readings um, so, so low beside these monitors? And we were told that what they do is, first of all, the, the people who run them, which is Monka Show, they clean up all around the, the, guy, the, the monitor. They cut the grass. Uh, and then they put a metal plate underneath the monitor so that it doesn't absorb much radiation. And then they install a special filter. I have no idea if all this is true. Uh, all I can tell you is what I, what I saw, my Geiger counter being twice what it said, and then further away, much, much higher. And of course, this is important because places like Itate Mura are desperate for people to come back. They're desperate to lift the evacuation order. Uh, on those places so that they can basically relive again, revive, uh, so the families and so on will come back. And if people don't trust the radiation readings uh, that the government is giving, then people won't come back. Uh, and my own belief is uh, it's very unlikely that if you had a family, I've got a two-year-old boy, uh, even if there's a doubt about the impact of, of radiation on your family, uh, I don't think people will go back. And, of course, what that means is that those 160,000 people who evacuated, uh, probably a lot more when we take in voluntary evacuations, from Fukushima, which is only 2 million people, if you remember, uh, probably will stay away. Um, I'll skip that one. Uh, no. This is a radiation cleanup. This is um, last weekend again. So what, what these crews do, this is a, a, another very interesting story. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but uh, Minami Soma, uh, which is the place we concentrated on for this article, uh, they have a budget of $240 million 
this year alone to decontaminate their homes, schools, and, and um, uh, public buildings all around the place. And what they, they send in these crews, uh, they don't have very professional equipment. This, as far as I can tell, is, is just a, um, a surgical mask. It's not a radiation mask. And they uh, scrape the ground. So they officially have to scrape five centimeters off the ground. And then they bag it. Then they send a power hose, a uh, guy with a power hose onto the roof, and they wash it down. Uh, and they spend about a week at these houses. It costs quite a lot of money to decontaminate one. Uh, and then the houses are generally built very close to forests, or forests are very rarely far away. You know? So when we were there, this couple, who I think I have a photograph with, Oh, yeah, well, it's not much good. <laughs> we can all do this. This, this couple, um, they were the people who, who, uh, uh, who lived in this house, and they were berating the contamination crew, and they were saying, look, you've just, so they had a Geiger counter. This is the another amazing thing. So many people have Geiger counters, you know, this 70-year-old couple. And they were saying, well, okay, the radiation in their house has dropped by half. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimasu. They kind of bowed. But then they said, what about behind our house, and he, they took them to the forest behind the house, which is about 10 feet away, uh, and the radiation was two or three microsieverts per hour. Uh, and this guy was, you know, very politely uh, saying to him, my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter, I have seven, has never been to visit us because we're scared about the radiation, and we cannot have any family reunions here because we're, we're, we just don't trust it anymore. Uh, and as soon as you leave, the rain is going to wash down the radiation back into my house and it's going to go up again. It might not go up exactly the amount that you know, it was before, but it will go up. What are you going to do about that? And this, again, this polite Minamisoma official said, I, I don't know. You know he said, I, I, I can't guarantee we'll be back. We will try. Uh, uh, and that was the way it was sort of left hanging. And, and you know, the longer this kind of goes on, really, uh, the more this tragedy continues. And I think there's, there's all kinds of solutions for what to do. One of them is for the government to just accept they cannot decontaminate an area this size. A couple more things. This is um, uh, a place called, uh, well, it's basically the Farm of Hope. Uh, it's a, a farmer who has stayed behind uh, in a, a very contaminated area. Uh, and what he says is that um, he won't move uh, because of the radiation, and he'll just become a guinea pig. And he raises his cattle as normal, uh, and the cattle, as far as we can tell, they're not milk cattle, they're beef cattle, as far as we can tell, they are so far unaffected by the radiation, except for white spots on their skin. So, uh, so this, nobody has seen this before. So all of these researchers from universities around Japan, there's about five of them in total, including Tohoku University, have come to this man's farm to try and experiment on his cattle because he is willing to stay there, he's willing to keep uh, his animals uh, alive and they are, he's becoming a human guinea pig uh, and uh, you should keep an eye out for him because I think uh, he is going to be in the news a lot. His name is uh, Yoshizawa uh, Mas Masami and I think I, let me explain just the background to this extract from the book. Um, um, this, is, this is Minami Soma again uh, around the March the 14th or the 15th, 2011. Um, and the citizens of Minami Soma have just seen uh, the uh, government's chief, spokes chief spokesperson uh, on, uh, on TV, uh, Idano-san, uh, saying how there's nothing to worry about, the radiation is being contained, uh, the disaster is under control, please stay where you are, don't move. And this is where we pick up in Minami Soma on March the 15th. Uh, the citizens of Minami Soma, on the border of the exclusion zone, did not believe Edano. Once they saw the explosions on TV, they immediately began to leave. The exodus started on March the 12th and turned into a flood by March the 15th, creating a traffic jam outside the government building. Cars inched by the mayor's office the faces of children pressed up against steamed up windows. Day after day, hundreds of people crowded the reception area below Mayor Sakurai's office, demanding information and help. Men cornered the mayor when they saw him walking through the first floor. 
What the hell is going on? Some shouted. Tell us what's happening, you asshole. He knew little more than his accusers. There was no communication from the government or TEPCO. Calls went unanswered. It was a week before anyone from the central government arrived and 22 days before TEPCO finally told Minami Soma about the drama unfolding at the power plant uh, a dozen or so miles away. Gasoline was the most common demand as people seemed started to flee, but it had to be rationed because after the first reactor explosion, delivery trucks began to stay away. City officials were sent to man the pumps, but... Sorry, now it started. Oh, started. Maybe we can just... Could you pause it? Oh, we haven't got any volume. Okay, but we haven't got any volume, right? Okay. <laughs> It's no good without volume. You have to get the proper flavor of this guy. Uh, <clears throat> so, sorry, local people, uh, city officials were sent to man the pumps at the local gasoline stand. The day after the first explosion, a tanker driver called from Koryama, about 32 miles away, and said he was not going any further because he was terrified of the radiation. Mayor Sakurai's staff had to go themselves and get the truck full of vital fuel. It was among the first ominous signs that deliveries to the city would stop coming. Food trucks and other utilities also seized. An exodus of city and medical workers from the city's biggest hospital began. How were they going to cope with the sick and the old? Who would retrieve the bodies still scattered around the city's coastal communities? On March the 14th, journalists from Japan's big newspapers and TV companies covering Minami Soma suddenly disappeared, meaning that the underground news from the most vulnerable large city in the nuclear crisis would vanish for weeks. They would not return for over a month. Some of the city workers had started to peel off too. My city was melting down, Sakurai says. In the middle of the chaos came the worst task of all. The exhausted mayor had to visit the makeshift morgue in the local agricultural college. The bloated bodies of men he had farmed with, friends of his family for years, were laid out on the ground. There were just no words for what I felt, he recalls. But there could be no question of deserting his post or even going to look for his parents. Duty to the citizens who had elected him came first. Only later would he find out their fate. At night, he would curl up for a few hours in the room behind his office, wrapped in a blanket. Before dawn, his eyes would open and he would wonder what fresh horrors the new day would bring. That's from the chapter uh, about Mayor Sakurai's experience. And the amazing thing when you meet him now is he's so cheery, you know, despite this horrible experience he went through. He's facing an election next year. He's quite confident that he's going to win. Uh, one third of the population of Minamisoma has yet to return. Uh, about 34, 35,000 people have stayed away, probably permanently, we don't know, but he thinks it's a danger that they will not come back. Uh, and yet, just this enormous positive energy that comes off him, I find him a very inspirational character. Um, did we get that sound not? Yeah. All right. Well, I can put this on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> this is my own video. Basically, he's, he's raging. I, I, I've never heard this kind of raw anger I've already heard it from, from a Japanese person, but certainly not from on TV about this disaster. He's just raging at the, the government, and he's saying, do you think anybody's going to come back to a place like this? No, <coughs> you know, it's not going to happen. The, not only is it radiated, but there's no services anymore, there's no schools, there's no hospitals. He says uh, uh, the government should just say that, that people aren't going to come back and have over with it. Thank you for listening. Um...